Throughout the second half of the 20th century, there were many projects for reworking some inner parts of inner cities. One such project were very large squares or plazas. So that is exactly what we will build today, right in the center of the city, next to the already built modernist commercial and office complex from last time. It will bring something totally new to this city part, provide more modern architecture and create some sort of a main gathering area for the whole city. But first, let's take a look at some of the real life projects to understand the why and how. And let's look at the first place right away, the Berlin's Alexanderplatz and its surrounding area. If you've ever been to Berlin, then you've probably walked around the place. You saw the TV tower and just saw the massive scale of the whole place. But it was bigger back then. All of these structures were not there originally. And instead of them, either huge paved open plazas or further outside parking lots. So we have to look at the old pictures like these ones that I showed previously. But here, let's not focus on the roads but on the open space, which is truly massive. Maybe not so much from this view, but certainly from the ground perspective. Before we get into its history, let's examine some technical things. So the place is huge, like I said. A lot of the area is simply paved without anything else, but the pavement has various patterns, materials and tiles. There are very few planters, a couple of benches around those, but that's it, just the pavement. And of course, combined with the open spaces, there are the Berlin's landmarks, so overall forming quite monumental feel. Okay, so what were the decisions that led architects and planners to build such a place? The area looked totally different before the Second World War, much denser with older city blocks. The district apparently wasn't even totally destroyed during the war. 1945 aerial views show collapsed buildings, yeah, sure, but also plenty with even roofs intact. 1953 pictures then show the badly damaged buildings removed, but others standing and looking more or less all right. But then in the later 50s and early 60s, all of that would be demolished anyway, to make way for big roads, big plaza and modern architecture. But why? Why not restore the city to its original look? And why change it as drastically as this? There are a couple of intersecting points in here. Some are also common with the Western countries. Some are only specific to the Eastern Bloc. But overall, the example of Berlin should illustrate the motivations. So first, why not restore war damaged cities to their original look? There was a general will to quickly move on after the Second World War, to leave the horrible past behind and only look forward. And better tomorrow means better new city. This, of course, has a very strong political dimension as well, as in the early years of communist rule, there was a strong emphasis to start building new society, of course, and not look back. Not to mention, it's a little easier to now make citywide decisions, because everything belongs to the state, everything is nationalized. And on top of that, modernist urbanists were already heavily criticizing old cities for a couple of decades now and successfully convinced officials that modernism is the way forward. Except old city, old buildings were in the way. But the Second World War conveniently took care of that issue. Not everywhere, though. I talked about modernist ideas most recently in episode 72, but just to quickly summarize. Healthier city through lower densities, large open spaces, higher buildings, not building streets or classic squares, separating functions and using modern architecture. It was also already clear that car traffic will inevitably require much larger roads and buildings will have to be much further away from these roads and this would just not fit between the existing old city blocks. So these are some of the basic ideas of modernism that were global. And overall, these were some key points when deciding how to rebuild badly damaged cities. Okay, so it's settled, we're gonna build cities differently, but why include the large plazas and boulevards then? So there is the architectural view, let's start with that. In the communist central Europe, there was the brief period of socialist realism between roughly 1949 and 1956, which made the architects and planners strictly follow some Soviet example. I most recently talked about socialist realism in episode 72, but also many others that you can easily find here on the channel. In socialist realism, there was heavy emphasis on monumentality. So 
some huge imposing structures combined with large open plazas or boulevards to show that monumentality. That is exactly the case of Berlin's Karl Marx Allee, uh, back in the day Stalin Allee, but also of many, many other socialist realism projects. However, monumentality did not go away with socialist realism. Modernism works with it too, but perhaps for different reasons. But in the end, the results are similar. Tall towers surrounded by short bases and large open spaces so that you can see that fancy new architecture and appreciate the clean and open design. This modernist idea was global, but outside of the Eastern Bloc, the open spaces were clearly less focused on just pavement for huge crowds of people, so working more with lawns, ponds, or even infrastructure. Next, we have the societal or political view, specific to the Eastern Bloc. Very large open plaza was required for gathering lots of people. This was done so that there would be some one area where the city's cultural and political life could take place. So various rallies, celebrations of numerous communist holidays, marches, political speeches, announcements, and so on and so on. So overall, a place fit for the new socialist city. This aspect was very strong in socialist realism, unsurprisingly, and it was very strongly involuntarily influenced by the Soviet Union. There are plenty of such squares in the Soviet Union, like for example the Kuybyshev Square in Samara, refurbished into its current look in the 1930s. It is also apparently the largest in Russia, uh, quite a bit larger than for example the Red Square. This particular picture immediately made me think of a completely different city in the 1950s, built in the 1950s in Czechoslovakia, also with a cultural center at the front, so the influences are quite apparent. Designers of the Alexanderplatz rework traveled to the Soviet Union to study its projects, and apparently Alexanderplatz was supposed to be heavily inspired by the Red Square in Moscow, but apart from being large, the resemblance is not quite there eventually maybe in some principles rather than look. Also, socialist realism, Stalinism, ended before Alexanderplatz was built. On a little side note, you might probably ask, what about military parades? Yes, those were common in the Eastern Bloc, but more often than not, did not happen at the newly built squares, at least in Central Europe. Alexanderplatz was not suitable for them at all, geometrically, so Parades took place on the nearby Karl Marx Boulevard. In Prague and Budapest, parades simply took place on existing large streets that were just slightly changed, mostly by paving or at least leveling a nearby open space. Warsaw is an exception. Parades did take place on a newly built square. Why? Well, because it was built earlier for it, during socialist realism, right next to the Palace of Science and Culture. It is apparently also the largest square in the entire Europe, by the way. And just like the Soviet examples, the palace is technically a house of culture. So it's just interesting how all these things connect. Actually, on a side side note, one problem of the early 1950s communist regimes was also the overall increased militarization. The military was just seen and heard everywhere, which kind of went against the also pushed narrative that the Eastern Bloc wants nothing but peace in the world. The communist leaders knew it was a problem and could lead to instabilities. So apparently the Czechoslovak leaders after the 1953 workers uprising in Pilsen tried to tone down the militarization. So perhaps that is partially the reason why after socialist realism we don't really see newly built military parade squares in Central Europe. Hungarians were also probably not that keen on seeing Soviet armor parading through the streets of Budapest after 1956. Older Berliners probably had mixed feelings about parades too. Now back to the plazas. So that was urbanism, architecture, politics, and now one more crucial aspect, wealth. This is nothing groundbreaking or specific only to the Eastern Bloc. Plazas and boulevards have been showing off wealth and serving as commercial hubs for a very long time already and would continue to do so all around the world. But combined with the previous aspect, together with the communist centralized approach to the economy and overall ideology, it would influence design of some places. 
we could see fancy looking department stores as part of new plazas, sometimes being the main central buildings of them to really push that showcase of wealth. In some places, this showcase was also meant towards the West, not just towards the local population, just like in East Berlin. Before we move on, one great example from the Soviet Union of such plaza, where commerce, culture, politics and everything else met, was in Pripyat, in the newly built city for the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in today's Ukraine. Pripyat, of course, being abandoned today. This place is special because it's relatively young and built from scratch to satisfy all the mentioned needs. But at the same time, it's an example of Soviets doing these slightly differently compared to the more Western countries. The architecture is somewhat different and there can be seen maybe some remnants of socialist realism design principles. There is, for example, just much higher emphasis on monumentality of the main buildings through that huge plaza. The very last piece of theory that needs to be mentioned is traffic. With Alexander Platz, I already talked about it two episodes back, but it's just something that needs to be mentioned again, because when you design a very large plaza in the city center, and at the same time you want to design grid of main avenues to cross the city center, then these two projects eventually meet. So how was that treated? Usually we find that plazas would be pedestrian only, and the traffic was diverted around it. Sounds great, except there was the danger of those roads being too large, so they would cut off the plaza from the rest of the city, or at least in some directions. We have already seen how the 60s and 70s designers wanted to fix that by building huge networks of streets in the sky. We have seen that plan for the center of Warsaw last time. Those were of course never built anywhere, so something else must have been done. Crosswalks are an obvious solution, but if the roads were too large or the road designers said no, then underpasses were the only solution. There are plenty of those all around Central Europe, under major intersections or even as part of some plazas or squares. If there is a metro station, which squares in the centers of large cities are likely to have, then combined with those. This is Dresden and we are interested in Pragerstrasse. Just like Alexanderplatz, there are various new buildings that make it difficult to see how the place was originally intended, but the core of the street was this part right here, dominated by the perpendicular buildings on one side and the very long one on the opposing side. Between them there are some lower two-floor commercial structures to again create that breathing space for the architecture that is supposed to be seen. In the middle there is that plaza. This overall project is different because Prager Street was supposed to be one part of a larger, some sort of a boulevard, starting all the way in the old town at the old market square with the new culture palace at the front. So once again, there is that similar element. That would be part for all the cultural and political life. And indeed, many pictures can be found showing various celebrations and communist marches in front of the culture palace. Then the boulevard would continue, it would be cut by a major road because it's just simply too long to bypass it, but there was supposed to be like a larger tower built right next to the road with some streets in the sky to bypass it, but that was never built. And then at Prager Street the wealthy commercial area would start, going all the way to Dresden's main train station. This part of Dresden was almost totally destroyed during the Second World War, so there was plenty of opportunity for a rework. The main road, as you can clearly see from maps, was diverted from the boulevard, so it would remain pedestrian only. Trams were also diverted away from the commercial area, which is kind of interesting because it also happened in Alexanderplatz, I guess to truly make that plaza only for people. Prager Street is also a huge inspiration for what I'm building here in the game. You can already clearly see that and I even borrowed some smaller details. But such places were certainly not built everywhere for various reasons. In the less damaged cities, the existing squares retained the function for gathering people, but commerce or culture was sometimes done elsewhere. But there are also examples of squares that were just lightly changed. 
In Katowice, the main square was changed to include some modern commercial buildings on corners of old city blocks and then opened into some sort of a modern boulevard with a huge avenue and modern buildings all around it. As you can see, it certainly was a very busy place for people as it probably was the commercial center, but unlike the previous plazas, traffic was not separated at all. Roads and tram tracks crisscrossed the square, cars parked everywhere, but as you can see, people didn't really mind. These days, the square is actually not bad at all. It did not see the densifying, as in Germany, because it was already pretty dense, and cars were properly banned from it, while trams remained, but slightly out of the way. In Prague, the public space situation is pretty sad. The Wenceslav Square ended as a huge multi-lane road and a parking lot. And to ruin it more, the previously mentioned North-South Avenue cut the upper part away from the National Museum. The situation somewhat remains to this day. The Old Town Square was an important gathering place for various celebrations, but other than that, it was pretty useless. So why not just have it as a big parking lot in the meantime? Other squares in Prague were the same and the situation only started to painfully change recently. Commerce was usually done in other parts of the city at various new department stores, either in the center or in the new residential developments. One quite rare situation was when a city needed to be built anew. Such was the case with Most. The old city was torn down as it was in the way of coal mines and people were moved into the new modernist part. So a new square had to be built as well. But it was not really a square, but the sort of commercial, cultural and administrative block, let's say. Most doesn't have a 3D view, so this will have to do. We can see that the whole area is built as one huge plaza with the buildings somewhat placed all around it. It is slightly sloped, so it was divided into multiple levels using ramps and stairs, just like we talked about it in the last video. Vesprem in Hungary is a city that was not built anew, but it significantly grew after the war. Apparently the population was more than tripled then, which created this somewhat urbanistically common look of smaller cities around Central Europe that would become somehow regionally significant. You have the old town, then around it large districts of pre-war detached houses, and then higher density concrete blocks of flats and industry. So the density in the city is not like gradually decreasing away from the center. And since the city grew so much, it also required a new commercial and cultural center, since the old square would not suffice for that purpose. So apparently a villa district was torn down just outside the old town and replaced in the 60s and 70s with something very similar to what we've seen in Dresden, just a little more compact and also still working with some of the old town buildings as the newly pedestrianized street starts in the old town with old buildings on one side and then it very closely switches to the modernist architecture. The, the place doesn't have a 3D view and I was not able to find that many pictures of it, actually not that much information about it, but overall it's just an example, somewhat similar to what we have seen already, but once again with unique final execution. In Bratislava, a new 70s-80s project was the Freedom Square, which is again different from the previous examples, because it's not built as part of some commercial area, it has university faculties and offices around it, and unlike the previous places, it is also significantly greener, although the green areas are mostly raised planters, so not intended to just step into and chill there. But back in the day it was used for some political rallies and fulfilled that function. Let's wrap this up. So we went over some of the theoretical background that went into the designs. Overall, it wasn't all that common to see these brand new complex cultural and commercial plazas in Central European cities, certainly the very large ones. Existing squares continued to be places for gathering, but commerce in some places shifted elsewhere, leaving the square emptier than before or today. Cars played a big role, the new plazas would be bypassed, but sometimes not perfectly, sometimes not at all. So in the end, these were one of the city projects that, unlike for example housing or traffic, were significantly different between the Central European cities of the era. Now, let's see our brand new plaza here in Altengrad. 
All right, so in today's introduction, I think I covered the motivations and inspirations quite thoroughly, so we don't need to return to that. And let's just jump right into the technicalities, how I put all of this together in City Skylines. So this entire project is all about the surface, of course, huge open surface combined with the shiny new architecture around it. The buildings that I placed here are mostly the French housing blocks because they just look very, very fitting for these kinds of projects. Uh, they are clearly very much different from the Eastern blocks, prefabricated blocks, but uh, at the same time, they have like similar modernist feel because they are all modernist architecture, so they must be somewhat similar in some regards. But uh, these kinds of structures in particular, they definitely have this kind of I don't know, this feel of like more customized architecture, especially when you are not really using them that much. In this particular case, I just use four instances of those buildings, even though I'm alternating between the two colors. So it is eventually something quite unique and I'm never going to use it, use it again in the entire city. So it is just gonna be custom made for this particular plaza. Now, then I'm using the house of the teacher from Berlin and uh, then some lower structures. Oh yeah, and one more French housing, I believe. That's the long building on that other side of this entire plaza, just like in Dresden. The, the layout inspiration from that place is quite heavy in here. Right, so those lower buildings, those are some, I believe, Russian commercial uh, buildings, uh, probably from the 60s, 70s, 80s maybe. And uh, then between those perpendicular long tall buildings, uh, there are the Polish, I think it's a hotel in real life, I'm not really quite sure. Yeah, these ones that I'm looking at right here. It's like a two floor structure, it's absolutely perfect for this particular uh, position. So yeah, it really does fit very, very, very well. Oh yeah, and base of the House of the Teacher building, that's made of the Sampola High School, I think it is, from Finland. It just fits absolutely perfectly there. Now, the main part of this project is the surface, of course. So I need to make sure that it's looking fancy. I need to make sure it's looking expensive. It's looking very new and just shiny and everything like that. So I'm just using these good old techniques really first to cover the entire plaza with uh, these, uh, these tiles, these decals. I'm using procedural objects for that, converting the decals into PO, and then just copy pasting them in this like a grid over the entire area. I'm leaving like a gap for the tram tracks because the tram tracks are gonna be decorated slightly differently. So I'm just, uh, you know, not covering it below. It's kind of useless uh, to do that. And uh, then I'm just going to uh, cut off the edges around the square and in some kind of detailed areas, detailed places. Unfortunately, this entire place has a disadvantage. It's kind of built in an angle. It's not really like a single boulevard like in Dresden. And it's not really like a single square like Alexanderplatz. It's built a little bit like uh, this part. And then it's just angling towards that old square in front of the train station. And it's not like 90 degrees. So there will have to be some sort of a connection between different angles of the tiles as well. Otherwise, it would just look kind of strange to have the tiles, uh, you know, not oriented parallel or 90 degree in, uh, in combination with the buildings or planters or something or infrastructure. So yeah, there will inevitably have to be some kind of connection like that. But actually some pictures from Alexanderplatz, if you look very close into some of those, they also show these kinds of transitions. And some transitions are more, uh, more pronounced because there is even like a different lane of different material, for example. But some connections are not. They are just uh, bigger like stone tiles that are just cut into maybe some kind of triangular shapes. And, uh, and that is that, you know, you don't really pay attention to it that much, I suppose. And you can, you can find many of these like uh, cobblestone tricks all around so these sort of plazas, old and new. So that's not really that big of a deal to do that. Unfortunately, I was not exactly able to fit uh, the sizes of the tiles like perfectly to some of the details. I did pay attention to match it to the tram tracks, at least where they are straight going from that park area. But uh, when it turns, it's obviously impossible. It just breaks that. Now, uh, I finally get to the main highlight of this plaza. And that is, of course, this red 
kind of like a snake or worm, maybe just the pattern of the different tiles running through the area. So how exactly did I make that? Well, with intersection marking tools, because back when I was doing this, intersection marking tools just got an update where you can use decals as filler types or filler materials. So that's just absolutely amazing because it's not only that, but you can also rotate the decals. They are going to be seamlessly stitched together. So that's just amazing on its own because if you want to fill like a large area with decals, if you don't want to convert them into procedural objects, you have to carefully align them manually so they fit. And with procedural objects, you just have to copy paste them in that kind of like a grid, yeah? But with intersection marking tools, they are just going to seamlessly be stitched together already and you can turn them around, you can scale them up and down and they are going to re retain that uh, continuous nature, that seamless nature, and you can recolor them. So I suppose that these are actually the same decals as the brown ones in the background, but uh, they are just scaled down and turned red. So it was super easy to do that and match it to the angle of this, of this road. That's a highway, by the way, because it needed to be something flat and without sidewalks, otherwise people might be a little confused walking around the area. And then I just can, I can just copy paste these decals to all the other segments or even just click a single button and it's going to copy to the entire length of that road. So seriously, like, like using decals and detailing with intersection marking tool, that's just never been easier at, at this point. So that's just great. That's just absolutely great. And it saved me probably a couple of hours doing this pattern. So that's amazing. Now, intersection marking tools is of course also heavily used all around this area on these tram tracks. So I'm using the modern looking concrete or maybe like stone inserts below the tracks or in, in between the tracks and then some sort of uh, decorative cobblestone patterns around it. Uh, this is actually something that I saw on some close-up shots of Alexander Platz. Uh, not only there are the very large tiles, but some of those darker like outlines, let's call them, they're actually made of these very tiny stones, like darker stones that are just creating these highlighting uh, lines, I suppose. So that's what I'm using here along the tram tracks and it's looking rather okay, I'd say. Then I started adding all those custom big planters and I made them so that uh, they are not the same. Uh, they do have the same shape. They all fit between this red line, but uh, they are differently scaled. I don't know, I just wanted to have some sort of non-uniformity in that particular area. And they are also placed so that there are no like lines shared between them. So, so yeah, it's a little bit randomized and it's eventually looking okay in that place. Then I started adding yet another one of those planters and I quickly decided, let's actually just turn it into a pond. Yeah, this one right here. And uh, it's just filling like a larger area. It's providing a different color into this place. That's very important, actually. It's a good contrast, the blue towards the red and some others. And I definitely borrowed, you can see that, that detail from Dresden. So I showed the picture of that, of that uh, fountain. I'm not really sure if you can call it a fountain really, just a pond with those uh, water jets maybe. They're not really jets. I'm not really sure. You've seen that, so you know what I mean. And I made it with procedural objects, just simple column and a ball. And I also added the procedural object effect on it. So I was not exactly sure if it's gonna look good. I just tried it. It was like trial and error. You could have seen it seen it here, how I tried different effects. And eventually I went for the water hose effect, like a fire truck water hose or something, and just scaled it to roughly fit the, the shape of that, of that uh, jet. And yeah, it's looking okay. You can definitely see that something's happening there. It's not just a static display. And yeah, I guess it paid off. It's a nice little detail. Now this shape right here, um, it was kind of too big, I suppose. So I filled it with some sort of very short commercial area. Maybe it could be some sort of larger cafe, restaurant, something like that. And then I had to return to this older part of the plaza where we built in the last episode that huge commercial building and the office and hotel. So uh, there needs to be some kind of planters in front of it as well. I used exactly the same tiling on the surface and here that really needed to be unified. 
and uh, then just some sort of pattern. In here it would not really work to create uh, like differently shaped planters, so I eventually went for these, these just ordinary rectangular ones. Although I did make them like zigzagged like this, as you can see they are perfectly fitting in that uh, pattern of the tiling. And uh, what exactly am I making these right now? Uh, what, what am I making here right now? So uh, these are just networks that I'm going to use as basis for putting these flowers on them. I think that I was looking at some of the floral patterns in uh, Erfurt, in the uh, gardening expo from the 70s or something. But I think that even today it has like similar patterns there of these flowers. And I wanted to have it so that it's going to be continuous between the planters. So I just used a network, I just made it into some kind of weird shape, and then I just used intersection marking tools again. Uh, and these are technically trees, so I can just, you know, put them on the, on the lane in the center and then just uh, do some sort of changes to the network and the trees are going to follow. So again, super easy to do that right now. And I just obviously cut it so that it doesn't go on the on the pavement and uh, fill the rest of the volume with some uh, different colors. And yeah, it's looking rather nice. Obviously there needs to be some sort of lighting around this entire plaza. So I picked these, these kinds of very futuristic looking uh, street lights. I believe that they are from, uh, I'm actually not sure right now, from Halle or Leipzig, one of those. Well, maybe it might be even Dresden, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure about those, uh, but they are kind of unique. Uh, I think that Meister Monis made these and specifically said that they are just unique to one particular place. So, well, in Altengrad they are going to be unique to this place right now. Right, and this is the most important part that I suppose everyone was waiting for. And that is actually making the entire plaza uh, functional and kind of alive. So, how exactly am I doing this? Well, it's not doing nothing particularly new. I'm doing this in Asturias all the time. And that's just making these pedestrian connections. First, using the vanilla elevated. That's very important. You have to do it with elevated paths. Otherwise, uh, they are just going to snap to the surface and completely ruin your detailing sometimes. And, um, and it's also going to be better visualized where the paths are going when they are elevated. And uh, well, it's the only way to do, for example, stairs. Now, then I'm just going to think of every possible pedestrian connection that people might take around this place. It's, it's kind of unfortunate that we have to do this. Uh, like obviously some sort of preferred technique would be to just paint that pedestrian area and uh, let the game decide where people are gonna go. That's kind of my uh, a little little expectation maybe for CS2. I know it's probably not gonna be there, yeah. Pedestrian paths are probably gonna be treated most likely exactly the same, but it would be really nice if it if there was some sort of possibility to just like paint larger pedestrian areas, you know, like plazas or something. Anyway, I digress. So what exactly am I doing here? It's kind of the good old technique. Yeah, just put the pedestrians everywhere. And uh, well, in here I'm doing something slightly different and I'm widening them with node controller. Uh, yeah, by the way, I forgot to mention. Yes, I did switch for node controller renewal. Only in Altengrad though, because yeah, sure, some settings do get transferred between the NC2 and NCR, but not all of them, and kind of imperfectly. So if I did the switch in Asturias, I would pretty much have to go around the entire city and just fix manually everything that I ever touched with Node Controller. And I'm just not going to do that. Yeah, there's just too many places that I already custom did. So in Altengrad it's different because I did not really use Node Controller all that much. And uh, for some reason with NC2, I was already getting some sort of errors, glitches, things like that. So I figured if I'm ever gonna switch to NCR in Altengrad, it has to be now before I finally get into building like huge interchanges, big highways and these kinds of things. So I already switched to it in the previous episodes. I think you could have seen that. And uh, yeah, then I had to do some little tweaks of places that I already tweaked, but it wasn't all that painful. And uh, slowly and painfully, I am learning NCR. But at this point, I have to say it really does bring some interesting features, especially with uh, like when you have an intersection that has many, many different connections into it. 
and shifting all those rows to make it fit. I think I'm going to be doing that in the next episode with NCR. And that's just something that NC2 is, uh, well, it is possible to do it there, but you just have to do everything super manually. So NCR kind of takes care of that. Although it's just two completely different approaches with certain things. So yeah, it's kind of difficult to get used to it, but um, you know, it is ev eventually, I guess, an upgrade, yeah. Right, so these are the finished cinematics. And yeah, th this looks this looks different. This looks very different compared to the old blocks that we used to have here. Now, by the way, back in the day, Altengrad was kind of like a, or had like a market area around this place. I'm not sure if you remember, but there was this like a, like a sheet metal, or not sheet metal, but like corrugated, no, not even corrugated. <laughs> I don't know, just kind of like a metal roof uh, market hall right where the house of the teacher is right now. So it kind of was like a market area already. And uh, well, we just took it further. We just made this place into like a very big market area. And it's not just market, but it rather offices, hotels, um, even housing, I suppose, in those red and blue buildings, but mostly commerce, yeah? And just place for just gathering big crowds of people, just like I talked about it in the introduction. So this place pretty much has everything and it, it is properly the center of the city right now. It's the center for pretty much everything. So that's what the city in a way kind of needed. It did not really have it. It was kind of fragmented into different places. So now we have it centralized into this huge plaza. I'm especially satisfied with how people, pedestrians in city skylines are just using all those pedestrian paths. Unfortunately, I know that procedural, uh, sorry, node controllers have the ability to just stretch lanes, but for some reason with pedestrian paths, people are still mostly walking in the center of the lane. And yeah, sure, they are somehow sometimes going to use the entire width, but more often than not, not really. So I eventually had to just use differently, differently scaled paths in this place. Uh, the 16 meter, 8 meter variants, and just kind of uh, alternate between them in places where it fits. And yeah, you can hardly tell that this place is actually made of like uh, specifically defined directions. It actually kind of looks like people are just using the place very freely. So yeah, that's that's very, very welcome. There was just this little uh, little like relief that I added to that uh, lowest commercial building right there. Uh, I got rid of the ramps. I talked about it in the previous episode and I made those terraces accessible for people. And I put those uh, commercial blocks into these procedural objects buildings. So uh, there is actually a purpose for people to go into those structures and do some kind of shopping there, like gameplay wise. Yeah, so it's not just like a place to go through, but uh, it's also a place, it's a destination, yeah? That's what I'm trying to say. So those tram stops that are nearby, they got uh, quite busy and it's also like a, well, kind of like a tram hub actually of the city because there are, there's like an important intersection. There are, you know, the different directions for the trams that are eventually going to cross the entire city. So yeah, it is a very important place. It's, uh, it's the new center of the city. It shifted from the old town, old town square perhaps, and into this area. It's completely bypassed by the major roads. Actually, I have to admit, at first I wanted to just put like a big avenue through the area, but I was discouraged from doing that uh, on, the, on the streams. Uh, and it was definitely a good decision to not do the, the road through the place. So eventually we bypassed the area with the urban highway from last time. That's exactly what I meant in that previous, previous episode when I said that I had to already plan this entire area in advance. And uh, we are later also going to add some other uh, like major roads that are just going to connect to the, to the urban highway in some places and provide some different uh, bigger capacity connections throughout the rest of the area, through some of the old blocks as well, over some of the older bridges and these kinds of things. Actually, that's that's what we're going to do in the next episode. We are going to take a look at that truss bridge, yeah, right there in the distance. And uh, we are going to do some renovations to it, add more lanes and just connect it better to some of the newly created infrastructure. Don't worry, there are not going to be any demolitions because it's pretty much like an existing road we are just going to slightly extend it. 
but it's not exactly going to look um, the same, you know? Anyway, that is going to be all. And uh, by the way, actually, I should mention right there in the distance, we have that new district. We are going to return to it in two episodes. Yeah, we are going to build some infrastructure. I don't want to spoil it too much. So that's where we're going to go. Right, that's actually all for today. So thank you for watching, guys, this episode of Altingrad. Hope you liked it. If you did, then please, as usual, do all the things below the video, clicking, writing, subscribing, sharing. And huge thanks to the channel members who directly support this channel and me, what I'm doing in here. Big thanks again. Take care, everyone. Goodbye.